John was king of England for around 17 years, from 1199 until his death in 1216. Thanks to the historical record and medieval propaganda, we know him as Bad King John. Not only did he plot to overthrow his own brother Richard I while the good king was away fighting in the Crusades, when he finally became king himself, he made a bit of a hash of it by losing Normandy and most of his French possessions. John is the king who overreached himself so much, the English barons forced him to sign Magna Carta, an attempt to place limits on the king's powers. So poor was his reputation, King John was even written into the Robin Hood legends as the villain, alongside his scheming sidekick, the Sheriff of Nottingham. Let's take a quick look at where John fits in our Kings and Queens timeline. He's here, coming to the throne 183 years after the death of another king with a poor historical reputation, Ethelred the Unready, and 450 years before the execution of another unpopular king, Charles I. His father was Henry II, who was about 12 years into his own reign when John was born. As the youngest of four legitimate sons, the chances of John ever becoming king would have seemed very remote when he was young. John's early life is thought to have been spent in Anjou, part of his father's kingdom in France. When he was four, in around 1170, Henry II fell ill and became concerned about what would happen after he died. To that end, he had Henry, or young Henry as he was styled, crowned as his heir. The second oldest, Richard, later Richard the Lionheart, was appointed the Count of Poitou with control of Aquitaine, while the third brother Geoffrey was made Duke of Brittany. Still just a small child, John was given nothing, and jokingly nicknamed John Lackland by his father. Despite being given these grand titles, Titles. John's older brothers were unhappy that they came with no power, which remained firmly in the hands of their father. For this reason, in 1173, all three, encouraged by their mother, who had by then become estranged from her husband, revolted, an action which would ultimately end in failure. Possibly as a consequence of all this, John, then just seven years old and at Henry's side throughout, became the king's favourite. When John was about 17, his eldest brother, the king-in-waiting, young Henry, died unexpectedly. His older brother Richard was suddenly next in line, and John moved up to third place. In 1186, when he was 20, John became second in line to the crown of England when his brother Geoffrey died. At this point, events in faraway lands were about to have an impact on Europe. In 1187, Saladin, the warrior sultan of Syria and Egypt, conquered Jerusalem. War fervour swept through Europe. Priests urged congregations to join the crusade to reconquer the Holy Land. In echoes of World War I, when men who'd not signed up for the front were handed white feathers marking them out as cowards, men in medieval Europe were given gifts of wool. In those days, a gift you'd give to a woman for not volunteering to fight. Henry II's son, Richard, was himself swept up by this fervour and was keen to leave. Only in the intervening years, as John had grown closer to the king, Richard had become more and more estranged from their father. Richard calculated that if he left for the Holy Land, there was a risk Henry II would appoint John as his successor. Richard delayed his departure for Jerusalem and stayed in Europe. He even seems to have tried to move events along by plotting with the King of France to overthrow his father. As ever, John sided with the King. Only, when the tide looked like it might turn, he sided with his brother, Richard. In 1189, the King was defeated by Richard in Anjou, and at that point he was ill and dying. The ruthless Richard revealed the truth to the old King. His beloved son John had gone over to the side of the rebels. Henry II died broken-hearted. Having delayed his departure to the Holy Land, the newly crowned Richard I was keen to get going. Concerned about what John might get up to in his absence, he forced his brother to promise to stay out of England for three years. John agreed, but soon broke that promise, setting sail for England, positioning himself in his Nottingham stronghold and plotting his rise to power. With the king absent, John spent the next few years basically causing trouble. As discussed in our previous video, Richard was captured and imprisoned by the Duke of Austria as he made his way back from the crusade, before being handed over to the Holy Roman Emperor himself. He would spend 14 months behind bars while his mother, Eleanor, raised money for his release. John showed no such sense of loyalty and instead plotted with the King of France, Philip II, to seize control of England while his brother was behind bars. He even offered the Holy Roman Emperor thousands of pounds to lengthen his brother's sentence. This sneaky offer was refused and Richard was released. It's fair to say that this is probably the point at which historians feel comfortable enough to label John as bad. This is also the period of history in which the legendary Robin Hood stories are set. In some of the legends, Robin is portrayed as having fought in the Crusades alongside good King Richard, and was arch enemies with the Sheriff of Nottingham, who answered to bad Prince John. Unfortunately, there's nothing in the historical record to show that Robin Hood was real. There are many records of outlaws with names similar to Robin Hood, usually with different spellings, but the first reference didn't appear until long after King John 
had died. It's more likely that Robin Hood was simply a catch-all term, a nickname for certain outlaws at the time. And if you wanted to pick an evil character from the history books as Robin's nemesis, who better than bad Prince John? Getting back to the real historical events. After returning to England, the understandably aggrieved Richard I deprived his conniving brother of his lands as punishment and banished him. Incredibly, Richard did eventually come round to forgiving John. Richard, by now in his late thirties, had still not produced a legitimate male heir, so John was even reinstated as successor. For all John's plotting, in the end, events went his way anyway. Whilst campaigning in France in 1199, Richard was shot in the shoulder with a crossbow bolt. The wound became infected and the king died. John was crowned three weeks later. The new king would find himself immediately plunged into a new crisis as war loomed on the continent. Though, to be fair, none of this was his fault. The problem was, the succession was disputed. The English and Norman nobility supported John's claim, but Angevin law stated that the crown should instead be given to the son of John's older brother Geoffrey, Arthur of Brittany. At that point, out of all of Henry II's sons, only Geoffrey had produced a legitimate male heir. The King of France, Philip II, saw an opportunity to break up the Norman English territories in France and encouraged Arthur's claim. Soon, the two rival factions were in open conflict. King Henry II, and then Richard, had aggressively contained the ambitions of French kings. Keen to avoid a war though, John came to an agreement with Philip II in 1200. The French king would support John as Richard's successor, but in exchange, John accepted Philip's right as the legitimate feudal overlord of John's lands in France. Many nobles were astonished and nicknamed the king John's Soft Sword. Despite his early attempt to avert war, King John's marriage to Isabella of Angoulême would kick things off anyway. Isabella had been engaged to a member of a noble family in Poitou, so when John came along and stole her away, the family appealed to Philip II of France. Philip summoned John to his court to explain himself, not as King of England, but as the Count of Poitou, another of John's titles besides King. John naturally refused to attend, and in 1202, war was declared. The war proved a disaster for King John. Militarily, he was out of his depth, and by mid-1204, Normandy, once the origin of the Norman dynasty, a key part of the kingdom, was now in the hands of the French. Not only had John lost a key part of his kingdom, he taxed his English subjects to the hilt to fund his failed military campaign. And the loss of his French territories weren't the end of his problems. Determined to regain them, and at the same time defend against a potential French invasion, the high tax regime continued unabated. To add to all this, John then went head-to-head -head with Pope Innocent III, one of history's most powerful popes. In 1209, he appointed his own man as Archbishop of Canterbury, then as now the most senior position in the English Church, and barred the Pope's choice from entering England. Initially, the Pope placed England under an interdict, meaning that the clergy effectively went on strike and refused to hold church services. In revenge, John seized papal possessions and land. The Pope's patience snapped and he excommunicated the King. Facing a crisis on two fronts, a potential French invasion, and now the potential of the Pope encouraging the King of France to invade and supporting him, John realised he was in a pickle. He admitted defeat and negotiated a settlement with the Pope. In 1214, John once again turned his attentions to his French territories, but he was defeated and turned home humiliated. To make matters worse, it's at this point that John faced a serious domestic challenge. Tensions with the English barons, particularly those in the north who had little connection with the royal circle, had been growing for years. Not only were they expected to hand over money to the king in the form of taxes, they had little or no say in the way the kingdom was governed. Unlike other monarchs, John was very much a hands-on king. He even worked as a judge in legal cases and developed a reputation as a distrustful ruler, constantly checking up on the barons. A peace conference between the king and the rebels was organised, but it came to nothing when John didn't show up. The barons had had enough. They renounced their loyalty to the king, formed an army and marched on London. Running out of options, John was forced to the negotiating table, eventually meeting the rebels at Runnymede in June 1215, where, in a bid to keep the barons off his back, he signed one of the world's most famous legal documents, Magna Carta. Magna Carta, or Great Chart, is cited today as the basis of all laws within a free society, with clauses promising fair trials for all and banning the sale of justice. At the time, however, it's clear that its prime objective was to limit the power of the king, specifically King John. For example, the first clause says that the king has no right to interfere with the church. There are also limits on unfair taxes, and to back it up, there's even a clause which says that if the king breaks the terms of the agreement, the barons had the right to take up arms against him. Thanks to the precedent it set and its place in history, Magna Carta is seen as the keystone around which all other modern laws were formed. But that's not the way that contemporaries saw it. To them, it was simply the latest in a long line of attempts to define the role of a king. Certainly John didn't take it very seriously. After nodding along with the barons and signing it, he almost immediately went to Pope Innocent III and appealed for help. Despite their earlier differences, the Pope took John's side and declared Magna Carta illegal. The barons were furious and prepared for civil war. The king's campaign went well, but the revolters appealed to the French. Prince Louis, King Philip II of France's son, later King Louis VII, 
was encouraged to invade England, defeat John and take the crown. Louis had a very obscure and distant claim to the throne via his wife, Blanche of Castile, who was a granddaughter of Henry II. Louis landed his fleet in England in the spring of 1216 and rampaged his way around the southeast. At the end of the summer though, John contracted dysentery and a month later he was dead. Louis might have thought he'd won, but with bad King John out of the way, English enthusiasm for a French ruler quickly evaporated. Louis quickly found himself unwanted and left. Within nine days of John's death, his eldest son, then just nine, was crowned King Henry III, who we'll cover in our next video. If you've enjoyed this video, you can hit the subscribe button below to receive an alert when we upload our next one. You can also help us to keep making these videos by sponsoring us on Patreon, using the link below.